Welcome to the Wealthy Circle Podcast, where we take a deeper dive into this year's finalists and winners from our wealthmanagement.com 2020 Industry Awards. These interviews cover the challenges, innovations, and trends in the wealth management industry and the individuals working to help advisors better help their clients. Hey, welcome everybody to the Wealthies Podcast. I'm David Armstrong. I'm the editor of wealthmanagement.com. Uh, this is the podcast where we hope to have good conversations with the folks who have uh, won one of our wealthmanagement.com industry awards. And today I'm pleased to be joined with John Anderson, the head of retirement plan solutions at Satera, and Casey Skidgel, the president of Summit Financial uh, at Satera. How are you guys doing today? Thanks for having us here, David. Yes. Sure. Let me make sure I'm getting your titles right. John, is that the right title for you? And, and what's your relationship with uh, Satera Financial there? And I know, uh, Casey, maybe you too. Satera's got the, the umbrella brand and then the, the brands underneath it. How do you, where do you guys all sit in that network? Yeah, thanks, David. That, that, that is my correct title. Uh, I run Retirement Plan Solutions here at Satera. We serve all of our advisors in helping them win, retain, and grow retirement plans business. So any advisor that does retirement plans business uh, that it impacts them in one way or another. We're we're basically here to support them, help them to grow, help them to maintain that business, etc. Okay, great. And you, Casey, where where do you sit? So I am the president, as you mentioned, of retirement plans for Summit Financial Group. We're an employee benefits firm. We actually are clear. We clear through Satera Advisor Networks. Got it. So you, uh, Satara Retirement Plan Specialist, won for the new 401k fee-for-service advice program. That was the uh, initiative that uh, uh, the judges uh, deigned the best in that category for the 2020 WealthManagement.com Industry Award. So congratulations for that, first of all. Yeah, thank you very much. We're obviously very, very excited, um, very humbled uh, to have won, uh, excited beyond, beyond everything else. So thank you very much, David. Let me ask you the way we start these things off. What, when you were designing this initiative or launched this initiative, what problem was it that financial advisors were having that you were seeking to solve or to help? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, one one thing historically about retirement plans business, um, and I think this happens internally at broker dealers, it happens in supporting advisors, it happens in implementation, is that many times the business can seem or feel siloed separate from direct wealth management business, separate business lines, separate support groups. Uh, which in some cases is true, but it can really feel that way. We we really didn't want that experience to feed through to the client experience. We didn't want an advisor to sit down with a 401k participant or any individual client and say, look, for 90% of your business, we fill out this agreement, we engage in this way, and we, we, we work on your wealth management business. But for this carve out for your 401k assets, we need to enter a whole different agreement, a whole different set of documentation uh, and paperwork. It just didn't make sense. It was it was clunky. And a lot of the industry still functions in this way that 401k assets with respect to advice to a participant have to be looked at separately. We wanted to streamline that. We wanted the engagement with clients to be clean. That 401k assets for any individual out there are really just part of their overall picture. It can be a major part, yes, but part of the overall financial picture. And we wanted to streamline that uh, by driving uh, 401k assets or 401k business and accounts in the same way that advisors engage more broadly. So the fee for service program and integrating 401k into that and specifically uh, driving the 401k asset engagement through fee for service really streamlines that experience. Um, and I think the judges mentioned this, they really liked integrating the advisor into, into the future of, of engagement with individuals. And the advisor is really critical to all of this in, in driving that experience. Uh, with individuals that really, really need their help. Usually the 401k assets are locked up in a particular, whatever the workplace plan is like, mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, you know, institution that workplace plan works with. You're making it easier for the advisor the on the individual level to bring in those assets or report on them or see them as part of more of a holistic financial plan, correct? Yeah, correct. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, they can't, they can't bring those assets out per se. Uh, they're in the plan itself. But we wanted the, the the participant experience to include those assets for that to be a comprehensive part or part of the comprehensive picture. Uh, and that's where this plays in, in the work that an advisor provides to an individual in the advice and the, the engagement uh, that it be looked at as one. It's always struck me as a little bit odd that, you know, an advisor takes a holistic uh, uh, view of a client's plan uh, without any insight into what maybe is going on on the 401k side. And if you brought those assets in, 
you could probably find, you know, risk uh, tolerance or risk, you know, uh, levels getting skewed, overexposure to certain sectors, overexposure to certain funds. Has, has that been your experience, Casey? Well, absolutely. I, I think one of the things that we often see is the average participant in a plan, just the, the fact that people move around from job to job. They also end up having, you know, they can have two, three, four financial advisors per se, because they've been at different organizations. And as they move, a lot of them just leave their assets where they were. So it, it allows you to put all of that together, talking about their 401k, as well as their potential IRAs and other um, places. Was there uh, uh, there's a technology component to this, right? I mean, uh, what you're doing basically is fixing the pipes behind the scenes in such a way that this stuff gets integrated into the, the, the plan. Uh, is, is it strictly a technology solution or is there kind of an advisor mindset uh, that needs to be kind of adjusted as well? I don't know who wants to take that one. I, I can start Casey and then I, I, I'd love for you, you to take it from your, your actual client experience. Um, but yeah, there's absolutely technology aspect in facilitating the engagement with clients. Uh, there needs to be today. There needs to be when an advisor is charging, charging fees for their services to clarify those fees and ease the way that clients uh, could potentially pay for those and also ease the client engagement through technology. But we didn't want it to be a full technology solution. It shouldn't be a full robo that everything is done online and the, the client kind of gets their own advice directly. I think the advisor needs to essentially play a critical role in that. Every individual has a different story, comes from a different place. Maybe like Casey was saying, has different 401ks across the board, a different financial situation. This allows an advisor to engage directly across all of those lines, uh, but also offer a more subjective, uh, more customized uh, approach to dealing with it, to dealing with a, a client's financial picture. Well, and, and John, to your point, you know, really, we believe that our role is to be the advocate for our clients. And so as you are advocating for them and on their behalf, sometimes that's coordinating with, in, in addition, not just their assets, but it could be their CPA that you're dealing with. It could be bringing that together to if they need a tax advisor. So it is. it has to be more than just an online solution. It has to be conversational and and we know that the people who are using advisors, that there are so many studies that are out there that talk about the fact, uh, I was reading a survey the other day, 75% of Americans you know, might choose to manage their own finances and they're not even getting help from a professional, no online services. Well, mm -hmm. that obviously causes a little bit of consternation overall because they might not be able to do it well. So they do try to do it on their own, but this brings it together. It, and so I think it, I think to your point, um, Dave and John, like it is a collaboration between the technology that is available, but also that human interaction and touch. Yeah, for sure. John, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say that, and I don't, I don't know, David, if, if, if this is part of where you wanted to go this conversation, but especially today, especially in today's, day and age with everything going on, I think an individual's complete and holistic financial picture is, in the, is right in their face in front of them, whether they wanted it to be or not. And they need help now more than ever. I mean, with things going on with this the marketplace from a volatility perspective, uh, what's going on with yeah. job losses, mm -hmm. job changes, and things like that, they really need expertise and people they can turn to. So to facilitate it for, through technology is critically important, but to also be able to drive uh, relationship and trust is, is critically important too. Yeah, you're definitely giving the uh, advisors that work with you a, sort of a, a, an additional tool to, to get a little closer to their clients and, and bring in those, uh, bring that perspective to them. I, I'm curious, I mean, so, you know, we talk about the people changing jobs and uh, a string of old 401ks uh, sprinkled through their history. Uh, do you guys do the whole, uh, you know, you help advisors tangle with the record keeping companies as well and trying to transfer the funds from one to another, from one place to another, maybe roll them over into the advisor's uh, advised IRA or whatever. Uh, you know, as, I, as someone who's experienced this stuff, as I think all of us have, it can be cumbersome and a lot of paperwork and burdensome. Is there something that you guys offer that helps the advisors streamline that stuff? So what's, what's interesting about the fee-for-service approach is it, it in, in a sense, it doesn't matter where all the assets are in giving your advice. So there's no real change of hands per se that needs to happen. 
Now, if mm -hmm. in that process, it's decided between the advisor and the client that really what's in their best interest is to mm -hmm. move those assets, then they can certainly help. But I think sure. what's really important is the advisor play that role in deciding or helping the client to decide really best interest, not rollover for the sake of it, not, not consolidation for the sake of it or, or, or for any other reason, except for the best interest of that individual. And Casey, I think you're, if, if you can, if you can take this question and kind of talk about your, your personal experiences there, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. So for us, one of the things that um, we are trying to do and that, that we've been doing with our clients is so we're helping them on the retirement plan. And then all of a sudden you start that conversation. We have about 11,000 participants overall that um, we get to work with. So right from the retirement plans that we're working on, there are participants within that. And so it, it becomes a one-on-one -on -one counseling back to John, your point earlier of people now more than ever need that opportunity where they can talk about their personal financial picture and there's just certain things that can't happen through the robo piece of it. So that one of the tools that is available that we have through Satera is actually what we call advice works. And that's actually putting all of those retirement plans or all of their assets, even outside assets. David, you mentioned, you know, how cumbersome it is at times if you're trying to make that. So whether they choose to move those assets or not, you can at least look at that financial picture. You can give them hypotheticals. You can talk about what their wishes are, what their wants are. And um, even if you know they have a spouse, you'd be able to add in the information about their spouse's income and things like that. So it's really taking it from the myoptic, just looking at their one retirement plan to developing an entire picture um, of everything that's available for them. Yeah, for sure. A little more broadly, I mean, it, it, you know, you talk about the assistance that uh, clients get. I imagine a lot of uh, workplace retirement plans are starting to offer some kind of financial wellness, financial health services to uh, their employees. Is that a place where you guys play at all? Uh, or do you find advisors kind of sometimes bump up against advice that maybe their clients are getting from their employees? Right. So for us um, at Summit, yeah, we absolutely, that's a part of our value proposition. We always say we not only hope help on the employer side, but also at the employee side. And so developing mm -hmm. a, a financial wellness program, it can be, I feel like um, in our industry, people tend to, and, and I come from a benefits shop. So my employee benefits team, the people that work on group health, they would make comments like, well, maybe it's a secession program or maybe it's a weight loss program. And we take it more in the financial vein with our mm -hmm. employers. And so then when you unpack that to be able to help them, we I was just actually on a call with someone yesterday talking about they have a $5 million plan. It's a bank. They've never had any employee education for their employees. So they're not getting any of that individualized assistance. Well, that's a part of what we are able to deliver for them is to not only help general group education, but we can, as John was mentioned, we'll be able to go in and help these individuals and help them create their own holistic picture. And then if the, if the organization wants from a financial wellness standpoint, well, it can depend. It can look a lot of different ways as long as we do one new thing to help their employees get one step closer to being able to retire, to be able to understand the picture that they have and provide that advice, I feel like I always say then we've done our job. So I feel like that's a, a big piece of it is going deeper with them. And we have tools that are available through Satera in order to do that. And I don't know, John, you want to um, pick up on any of that or elaborate at that piece too. Yeah, I, I, one thing that's that's been really evident in recent times is that employees are turning to their employers more for this sort of advice. They're working a lot more people working from home, a lot more people working remotely, uh, mm -hmm. and employers are looking to provide these sorts of resources to their their employees. Uh, these financial wellness programs offered at the employer a way to increase retention, drive engagement by their employees, show their employees how much they really care about their overall financial wellness. And their wellness in general it doesn't have to just be about 401k. It can be about, uh, like Casey's talking about, the broader broader financial wellness. We, we do enable our advisors to provide uh, financial wellness programs at Cetera. We have programs to help en enable those conversations 
uh, workshops uh, mm -hmm. they can deliver via Zoom, via distance or in person when that's available, drive those open discussions and that security. So employees don't have to worry about their financial situation. They can know where they are and know whether they're on track or know uh, what they have to do to make the proper decisions. One of the a survey that I was reviewing and, and Sherm had done this on financial wellness and it 44% of employers believe that offering additional guidance on handling finances will actually decrease the time that their employees are spending at work personally tending to their financial issues. So we know that it's an, we know it's a challenge. We know that there needs to be something that will help them. So even if it is, maybe you have a workforce, we have an example of this with one of our um, clients. They have people that are closer to the age of 65. So they have um, more of a older population that's more mature. They contacted us and said, we need help with social security. People don't know what to do. Well, there we can use that as our jumping off point in order to help really guide and hone in on that piece. And so to me, that is an example of financial wellness. And if I take it back, you know, we have a lot of the, that sandwich generation of, they might be caring for elderly parents, but on the other side, they also have kids in college and they're worried about um, debt and college savings and things like that. Well, what if as, as an advisor from a financial wellness program, you can go into that employer and say, hey, let us sit down and counsel with your employees and talk about these things. I think that's where the value becomes. There is something different about the human interaction that happens when you sit one on one across the table from someone and they're able to tell you their situation back to John's point earlier. It makes all the difference in the world because then you learn what they need at that time. And that's what people are really crying out for, in my opinion. Yeah. Do you have uh, some statistics on uh, uh, plan sponsors who do this kind of uh, make this kind of effort to work with uh, advisors to bring these kinds of programs to their employees versus those who don't? You know, it's interesting. I, I was actually before um, in preparation for today, I was reviewing a couple of different studies. I don't have on my personal book of business, but I do mm -hmm. have stats overall. And what's what um, was interesting, there was a study done by Alight in 2019. And um, they said, you know, the question was asked, well, can companies offer a financial wellness program? And interestingly enough, 84% of them wanted to do that to enhance the overall employee experience. And 82% of it say they want to do it just because they think that it's the right thing to do, but yet the uptick on it is actually much smaller. I think it was 24% it might have been. And I might have to get back to you on that exact stat. I was mm. trying to scroll through here to, to make sure that I had that number. But it is interesting that not as many of them actually implement a financial wellness program. So to me, that's where I would say, advisors, we can have an impact if we'll just do something, if we'll take that time to implement one thing new that it, that we could do each year in order to help further their education. Because when people are educated, they make better choices, right? We all know that. So that, that would be what I would comment on that piece. And John, do you think that maybe, and you know, the, I don't know the exact statistics. I mean, that's great. I think we get this the idea that more plan sponsors think they should do it than are actually doing it, right? I mean, it sounds like a great idea, but the implementation is they hesitate to implement. Is one of the reasons that they hesitate to implement these kind of programs because th there's a fear that, you know, who's taking on the responsibility here of the quote unquote advice? They don't necessarily want to be liable in some way, right? I mean, is there a fear of liability that plan sponsors have for, is that keeping them back from a whole bringing a lot of these things to their clients or to their employees? I, I'd, I'd be really interested in getting Casey's perspective on that. I, I, I think there's two really two things to think about. One thing, if I can go back, back to it a little bit is are, are participants better off when advisors are involved in the plan? And I don't have the exact stats here. We've, we've used them a number of different times, but uh, stats show it, that participants overall are better off. They're better prepared for retirement, that they have lower financial stress. So that established plans that have advisors uh, participants are better off. Uh, second to that, why are plan sponsors not engaging in wellness solutions historically? Historically, 
I would, I would say the number one reason is their business is not running a retirement plan. Their business is running uh, whatever they're, business. they're focused yeah. on their business, right? They're selling widgets or, or they're operating a restaurant or they're pulling teeth, right? As dentists, <laughs> as dentists do. So they're focused on their business, but we've seen this, or I've seen this from our perspective as one of the fastest growing aspects of the 401k industry, which is business owners wanting to implement these wellness solutions. They understand that if they don't provide uh, this sort of resource to their employees, uh, their employees are going to be increasing their financial stress. They're not going to be able to focus on their business. So if they want their employees to focus on their business more and be more productive, they need to help them take all their stressors off of their plate. And I think we see this trend overall, which is more employers more concerned about mental wellness and overall wellness of employees that free them up to be more productive. And that's how the conversations have, have been going. And advisors have the ability to, to be, drive that conversation now and, and show that benefit. Casey, I'm really interested to, to hear why you think that could potentially be happening, why employers wouldn't, if it's a risk issue or, or what. Yeah, that, that is such a great question. And, and um, whoever can answer that, I think, is is way smarter than I am. But, but what I would say and what we talk about internally. So I think I mentioned we're an employee benefits firm. So I'm constantly mm-hmm. coordinating with my, with my health and welfare team. And what you have to always remember is that you typically have HR who is very concerned about their employees. Think about the things they're dealing with right now. Right now, they have to be a nurse taking people's temperature, potentially. They have to be counselors helping people to know, should I stay home? Should I come to work? So they're overwhelmed. And and I have talked to HR reps during this time that are saying that. But also, you, um, you think of the CFO, what are they worried about? They're worried about productivity. They are typically the, the person in the C-suite that's having to deal with their health care costs. So that is with skyrocketing health care costs. That means such a critical component of it. It's like, where do you fit in? We have to do certain things on the health care side of it. So then where do we fit in this financial picture? It, it is. It's obviously, I, I think it's four out of five employers say that those personal financial issues are impacting their employees performance, but they just don't know where to fit that in. And I don't know that they recognize what's happening always. You also have to look at, you have to also look at small companies versus large companies. Remember an HR person could be very, very stretched if they're uh, with a smaller organization, they might be the office manager, the HR rep, Whereas some, an employer that has, you know, 1,000, 2,000 employers, completely different story. They're managing other risks internally. And, and I think that's a, a piece of the overall puzzle as well. Yeah. And I imagine with a larger company like that, there's probably internal stakeholders that have to be uh, sign off and navigate through, navigated through as well, which can be its own challenge, as I'm sure you know. For advisors who maybe are thinking that this is a area plan sponsor clients that maybe they want to approach. Is there a kind of a sweet spot in terms of the, the, the size of the client that would be most amenable to something like this? I mean, you already talked about maybe too small, the HR person's stretched thin, too large, that's got its own hurdles. Is there kind of a place where an advisor who maybe is thinking about trying to attack this market, where should they start? How can they get into it? And, and John, you may want to pipe into this, but from my um, perspective, You need to start in a place, just like you said, where you have the buy-in. So the employers who have the buy-in and they say, yes, we'll do this. I think that's the, that's where you want to go and you want to try it out. So something we just did with one of our clients, we had a plan review. We were talking to the CEO, HR, both on the call. And we said, Hey, can we, what do we need to do this next year? in order to continue to improve and allow your employees to grow in their retirement plan and um, feel the value that they're getting. So we are actually taking the CEO as our kind of guinea pig, if you will. And he is actually Mm -hmm. going to go through the process with us on the individual financial planning. Because what I know is if I get the CEO to buy in and he feels like the tools are valuable for him and that he can better see his financial picture, then he is going to say to the rest of the employees, this is something that you should do. So as an advisor, take the relationships, you know, I, I, I guess I'd say take the low hanging fruit, the relationships and the organizations where you know you can make an impact initially 
and use that, then it can flow. I don't know if there's a dollar, what is more attractive for an advisor. Obviously, most of us are, are very well and I hate to generalize, but attorneys and things like that will typically white mm-hmm. collar, they're going to be typically a little bit more engaged in certain things, but but I will tell you some of our best clients are, are those hardworking Americans who they really want to develop that plan and they'll slow down enough for you um, to talk about. So I don't, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a size of a plan. I think it's more relationship and, and that's what our business is all about. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So uh, what's next for you guys? I mean, you won the award for the 401k for fee for service advice program. Great. What, uh, John, is on the uh, the horizon for uh, Cetera retirement plans? Anything else that you're working on? Where else can we expect you to, to move to next? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, David. I think we, we've been really talking about it today. It's expanding financial wellness programs, it's expanding yeah. the services that uh, business owners can bring to their employees and really reduce financial stress and improve outcomes, improve financial decisions. And this is empowering our advisors because we think advisor run plans. And this, like I mentioned before, the statistics, the statistics show it um, are just better off. We want to enable them to provide that sort of wellness to business owners. So they can, like we said, focus on producing the widgets and do what they do. And the average American worker out there can just be better off, right? That's what we're continuing to roll out and expand and grow uh, and expand the ways that our advisors can, can offer those services. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. You know, we're at uh, about 30 minutes. This has been a great conversation, guys. Uh, congratulations again on the award. Uh, well-deserved. Doing great work out there. And I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to us about it. Well, thank you very much, David, for having us. We're still uh, thrilled, obviously, to have won the award, uh, the award. Thanks again for your time today. This content has been made for information and educational purposes only. The views and opinions represent the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of wealthmanagement.com.